just going to move that. It's going to throw me off. I'm going to run into it. I'm going to knock it over. It's going to be so loud. Hey, we're going back to another poll. So if you would please get out your cell phones. We sent this poll out when we started the series. It's the end of the series. We're re-polling. No pressure, but have a better answer. Uh, you're going to send two texts. The first one is going to be to the number 22333. And that first text is going to say John Barr 454. Then your second text is going to be one letter, A, B, C, D, or E, that answers this question. How many minutes per week do you meditate? We asked this seven weeks ago. We'll look at those results here in just a minute. I want to get the new numbers based on the fact that we spent better part of a month and a half, two months, talking about meditation. So send two texts, first to John Barr 454, or with the phrase John Barr 454 for the number, and then reply. Great. Uh, I hope that this series has been helpful. I hope it's been uh, educational. hope it's caused some deep thought throughout the week. hope it has changed your habits. Uh, and I hope it's caused you to want to do more research. Uh, as I've talked to people outside of this weird speechifying, I've heard a lot of people suggest that they had never thought about meditation this way, or they hadn't studied it, or hadn't even practiced it this way. I hope that you have now, and I hope that you're seeing the results in your life. I hope you're experiencing changes in your life because of this practice. If you want to learn more about it, there are plenty of books out there. I especially love Celebration of Discipline. The very first chapter in that is all about meditation, and I think the way he sets it up is fantastic. We had 21 answers last week. Uh, this, that's fewer than 21, but I'm liking the spread of the numbers. We'll leave that up there for a couple more minutes. As a reminder, we've discussed meditation for the last two weeks. We started off the first week talking about what is meditation according to the Bible. We looked at what the Bible says, what examples are given to us about meditation in the Bible. And then we looked at different topics every week where we took three separate passages in the Bible and explored them to find out what we could meditate on for each topic. So we looked at God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We looked at the Word of God, the Kingdom of God. Uh, and this week we're looking at right behavior, things that the Bible says about how we should act. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so, so far, we're seeing most of the people trending right there in the middle with 1 to 10 minutes a week or 11 to 30 minutes a week. Let's go ahead and switch back over. Maybe we'll come back to this later. And we can see the results from last time where most of the people were falling uh, either in the middle or at zero. And I'm hoping that these people come down into here and that these people hopefully are coming down into here. If you need help on a practical level of getting started meditating, a good guided meditation app is a great way to get you into the practice. Now, the meditation we're talking about is not that kind of meditation, but until you can sit quietly for a long period of time, meditation is going to be quite difficult. So find one of those apps. I like Headspace because uh, the version I have is free and I like free. So today we're talking about meditations on right behavior to wrap up our series. As a reminder, our method that we're practicing, we start off by praying and asking God to guide our meditation practice. We choose a passage and study it at length to try to understand all that we can about it so that when we meditate, we have that opportunity, we're in a good place to receive more. And I suggest removing your distractions and just getting quiet for some period of time. And then afterwards, after your time of meditation, or perhaps even during your meditation, seek to create something, to either record your thoughts or to have some sort of creative expression of the things that have come to you during that meditation process. So today we're talking about right behavior. We're gonna talk about love, shine, and deny, but we have to get some context on this idea first. And to really understand the idea of right behavior in the Bible, you have to ask yourself, what is the Bible? And the way you answer that question is going to determine how the Bible tells you about right behavior. For example, a lot of people think that the Bible is a rule book. That's what it exists for, to tell you what to do to restrict you from doing the things that you want to do, perhaps, and make you do things perhaps you don't want to do. That's how a lot of people, hopefully not us here in this building, think about the Bible. And if that's how you feel about the Bible, then this idea of right behavior becomes compulsory, right? You have to do these things if you're going to be a follower. I don't believe that's what the Bible is meant to be. I believe the Bible is the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. That is the Bible. The Old Testament, the things that come before the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, are is background. 
Okay, so the Gospels tell the story and the Old Testament provides context because the Old Testament tells us all about Jesus's family, all about the culture that he would have grown up in, all about uh, the things that his family would have studied and believed and talked about and the things that would have shaped their day to day life. That's the Old Testament. And then we have the story of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection. And then we have the epistles, which are application. All right. The epistles the letters that were written by wise men to early Christians to answer their questions and to explain to them how to apply Jesus's life to their life. So with this context in mind, when we look for right behavior, where do we look? We could look to the Old Testament and look to all of the rules and all of the laws that are laid out in the Old Testament. We could look there. There are plenty of rules and laws there, but we see in that same Old Testament how life goes when you try to follow all those rules. It doesn't work. We're not prepared to do that. We are not able to follow all those rules. We sin. That's what we do. So looking into the Old Testament and looking to that way of life is faulty. We could look to the epistles. There are plenty of rules to follow, plenty of examples given on ways that we can live our life. But some of those are written by a specific person to a specific person at a specific time. And then the burden is on us to determine which ones are meant for us, which ones are meant for examples, which ones are meant to teach us. And that's also a good place to look, but that's hard. You know, it's easy looking at the words of Jesus. We have in the gospels preserved for us the words of Jesus, the son of God. And in many instances, he speaks directly to his disciples, his followers, the followers of Jesus, and tells them what to do. We can look at his words and how he explained things to get the best ideas on how to meditate on right behavior. So that's what we're going to do today. Starting off with John 13, 34, and 35. We talked a lot about love already today. Let's keep talking about love. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, let's look at the context of that. You've got to look at all of John 13 to get a good handle on this. And he starts off in the first 17 verses by washing the disciples' feet. He has this amazing act of service to the people who were following him. He cleans their feet. They would have been gross and disgusting and muddy. And he gets on his hands and knees and washes their feet. This is a great allegory for service and for how Jesus wanted us to live. Then, in verses 18 through 30, Jesus predicts his own betrayal and death. And then Judas, who is going to betray him, leaves. Leaves the room. And so in this time, he speaks to the people around him. And he says, when he was gone, that is Judas, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. He's saying, the Father and I are one. And the thing that I'm about to do, this sacrifice that I'm about to make, is meant to glorify God, and by that nature, glorify me as well. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, I will tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So he has this act of, uh, of servitude. And then he tells them that he is about to go. And then he gives them this new command. He knew his time on earth was short. He showed his disciples how to serve. He explained that he was leaving soon. Then he told them that their defining characteristic, the way that everyone will know that you are a disciple of mine, is that you will love one another. Okay. Now let's look at some of the terms here to kind of understand this. So he says, a new command I give you. But as we've seen before, there are lots of places, even in the Old Testament, that say you are supposed to love your neighbor. So why can he say this is a new command? Well, in the book of John, this is the first occurrence of Jesus saying, love one another. Now he's talked a lot about love. The word love appears 39 times in the book of John. But in every other instance before this, he's been saying, love God, or he's been talking about God's love, or he's talking about uh, different kinds of love, but he's never said to love one another. So as far as the story of Jesus, as told by John, this is the first occurrence of this new command, which is to love one another. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what is the standard? 
What is the goal? What is the objective? What is the marching orders on how to love? To love as I, Jesus, have loved you, the disciples. And how has he loved them? As he demonstrated earlier with his servitude, he loved them sacrificially, right? He was willing to go all the way to the cross for his disciples, for them, for us, for everyone. That's the type of love that Jesus is exemplifying, and it's the type of love that he is calling them to. As I have loved you, that is sacrificially, so you must love one another. By this, this is the foremost evidence of how people will know you're my disciple. This is the way. Do people know that you're a follower of Jesus? And if so, how? There are lots of ways that we can show, that we can demonstrate that we're followers of Jesus. We can wear crosses. We can wear t-shirts that say, yay, Jesus, or whatever. We can uh, tell people about that we come to church, or that we uh, study the Bible. We can carry a Bible. We can give people Bibles. There are lots of things we can do. But Jesus said the number one way, the defining characteristic of my disciples is loving as I have loved. So if we are going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, we can wear shirts and we can wear jewelry and we can give out Bibles, but we need to love as the primary reason. And we need to love the same people that Jesus loved. If we're going to love as he loved, then we need to love the people that he loved. Well, let's take a look at that. How do we love like Jesus? Number one, he was very concerned with the needs of the unprivileged. If you look at the life of Jesus, he spent time with people who were sick and in need of healing. Healing that wasn't available by any other means than by the power of God. That's who he spent time with. He spent time with people who were poor. He spent time with people who were outcast. He spent time around people who didn't have friends. That was how Jesus loved people. Yes, he spent time around his disciples. He spent time around other people. But he mostly concerned himself with the unprivileged. We need to do the same. We need to explore the idea that we are not solely responsible for the things we have. God has blessed us amazingly and unbelievingly. And so we need to recognize that privilege we have and focus our efforts on those who have not had that privilege. We need to give sacrificially. That's how Jesus gave. He gave his entire life. We need to give sacrificially. We need to be a conduit with the understanding that God wants to bless people and sometimes he blesses you to bless them. That makes sense? Maybe the reason that you have the money in your bank account that you have is because God is intending you to give it to someone else, not so that you can just have nice things. You are to be a conduit, as Jesus was a conduit. Jesus used the power of God to heal people. We need to use the blessings of God to help people. And finally, we should be different. Jesus was very different. People who heard about Jesus wanted to go see him because he was so weird. We should be weird. We should be so loving that we shouldn't be confining our love to the way the people around us act. We should be different. We should be different enough that people recognize that we are disciples of Jesus. The love that we were talking about earlier, how love is an action. Love is something that we do. It's a decision we make. It should be enough to define ourselves differently than others. So what meditations can we take from this passage? We should meditate on the idea that love is our defining characteristic. If, someone was to, if I was to go to one of your friends or one of your neighbors, one of your coworkers, somebody you spend a lot of time with, and I said, tell me about Kyle. The defining characteristic of Kyle should be that he is loving. That's tough. That is tough. Because that's not the first thing I think of when I think of Kyle, no offense. I think that he's funny and incredibly good looking. Um, but we want people to think of us as loving. And in order to get there, we are going to have to act in a certain way. So love is our defining characteristic. Jesus' love is the standard. When you're thinking about how much do I need to love, you don't just need to be so loving that you're weird. You need to be loving all the way up to trying to reach his standard. We are the delivery method of God's blessings and that you have a unique set of people to love. There are people in your circle of influence who are not in anybody else's circle of influence that are here. You might be the only follower of Jesus that some people know. If that's the case, you are the delivery method and you are the unique delivery method to those people. And that's something you can meditate on first thing in the morning. It's going to change your entire outlook for how you live your life. So again, from John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples 
if you love one another. Moving on from there to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put <clears throat> Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's look at the context of this passage. So Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And we talked about this last week. We talked about it a couple weeks ago as well. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' first recorded Sermon, his first recorded long-form speech to his followers. And this is right at the beginning of that. At the end of chapter 4, we see who the audience was for the Sermon on the Mount. It was large crowds of people that were coming to him because he was serving as a conduit. We just talked about that. He was healing people miraculously. And as the word of that spread, large groups of people who had sick people among them came to him. And so at the end of chapter 4, we see it's a large group of people, again, the unprivileged. He starts off the Sermon on the Mount by explaining the characteristics of those people who have encountered their sinfulness. That's what the Beatitudes are. The Beatitudes are a list of characteristics that come about once we have acknowledged and come face to face with our sinfulness. And we've walked through the steps that he outlines in those verses. We talked about that. It's been a couple years now. That's what he starts off with. And then he immediately transitions from that into verse 11, where he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, this is early on in his ministry. Again, this is the first recorded sermon we have in Matthew. And he's already telling people, you're going to follow me. That's great. Get ready for insults, persecution, and lies being told about you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's the context that sets up this passage where Jesus is talking about salt and light. So he's told them, you're going to have to encounter your sin, and it's going to be painful. You're going to develop these characteristics because of it. It's a two group of people who have struggles. He explains that life is not going to get any easier. You're going to encounter your sin. People are going to lie to you. People are going to persecute you. But you will have this reward in heaven. And then he transitions from that into this passage. So let's look at the terms here and explore it a little bit more. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, there are so many metaphors we can draw out of this. The salt of the earth. Salt at that time was different than it is today. It wasn't the pure, beautiful white crystals you can buy for like eight cents in the supermarket. It was this impure thing that they got by taking salt water and letting it dry a little bit. And then they sold this white powder. And it was a commodity. There were, you've heard of the term salary. That's from the idea of salt. It was used as a preservative before refrigeration. If you had this nice hunk of meat, you could just rub so much salt on it that it was disgusting, but it wouldn't go bad. So that was nice. It was also used as a flavoring, just as it is now, called the mother of all spices. Salt can pull out the flavor of all other spices. It can pull out the flavor of all kinds of food. Salt was a necessity. Salt is a necessity. And so he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. And he might have meant that as a preservative, right? He might have meant that as in we, as his followers, are meant to preserve a certain way of life. We are meant to hold back the foulness that tends to settle in on life. We are to be a preservative. We might be a flavor meant to bring out the good in the people around us and to uh, amplify their lives. Or we might even be a commodity. We should be something that is sought after, this way of life. Followers of Jesus should be so loving and so salty in a good way that we are sought out and people want to be around us. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how could it be made salty again? This impure salt that we talked about just a minute ago wasn't as stable as the salt we have now. And so if it was left out or if it made contact with the ground, it would dissolve the salt away and it would be left with these impurities. And it looked a lot like salt. All the impurities had that same uh, chalky nature and the same color. And so it wasn't until you tried to taste it or tried to use it that you realized it was no longer salty because those impurities had taken over. So he's saying, if the salt loses its saltiness, which happened, why, how can it be made salty again? It can't. That's a metaphor. It can't be. 
and it's no longer for good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That's how we use salt today sometimes. When it gets icy outside, we'll throw salt on the ground so we don't slip and fall as much. So he's saying, if we are the salt of the world, we are these things, and we need to stay pure. We need to stay uh, flavorful. He continues his metaphor, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. There are things that light can do, right? Light can show a path in a dark place. And that's what we are to do. We as a light are to show people the path to God. We are to illuminate their way. We can also uncover that which is hidden. We as Christians should not be afraid. We should not have things that we want to keep hidden as much. We should be willing to have light shown on our lives. That's a service that Christians can render. And he's talking about lights here. And again, the lights were much different than they are today. I actually did some research on lampshades because I caught myself wondering why we go to so much trouble to get these really bright light bulbs and then shade them. Uh, and I think it goes all the way back. This is, this is theory here. I think it goes all the way back to like when light was first a thing and it wasn't super bright like this, right? It was these gas flames that were somewhat unpredictable and not that bright. And then when the first light bulb came out, People were shocked. They were like, what is all this madness? I'm used to this flickering orangey flame and I could look right at that and be fine. But now it's this electricity and it's ah. And so they decided to put shades in front of the lights and now we have lampshades. That's just my theory. But <laughs> also uh, these lamps, in order to use these kind of lights effectively, they needed to have reflection. They couldn't just let a flame flicker right there and illuminate everything around it. They would have to have mirrors here and mirrors here and then put it up high so that that light could be reflected into the area that they needed. He hear that for them by saying they will see your good deeds. So the light we are shining is our good deeds, is our right behavior. To pitch it all the way back to the title of, to pitch it all the way back to the title of the sermon. And glorify your Father in heaven. And we've talked extensively about this, but I love this idea that when people see our good deeds, they should be moved to glorify God. They won't be moved to glorify God if we are not known as followers of Jesus. Right? They'll just see us doing good things. Be like, oh, that's a good person. Kyle's such a great guy. He feeds the hungry. What a nice guy Kyle is. Kyle's a good person. Kyle, 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 Kyle. But if Kyle notoriously gives credit to God every time he does something like that, then people will be moved to give God the glory because Kyle's letting his light shine. Got to be nice to Kyle. I was mean to him earlier. It's very simple. So then, what meditations can we take from this passage? We are the preservative and the flavor of the world. Think about that. Again, if you're doing your meditation first thing in the morning and you think about how you are to be the preservative and the flavor of the world around you, aren't you going to act differently? Aren't you going to live differently as you go out and be around people? We illuminate the path to God through our actions. If we're going to be a light, and we should be illuminating the path to God. So when people look at us, they should see how to get to God. Finally, are we giving God the glory? It's already his glory. It's not really our choice to give him the glory. It's our choice to not try to steal his glory. When we do our good deeds, we need to give him the credit. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And finally, let's look at denial. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, and then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Let's look at some context here from Luke chapter 9. So again, he's talking to the disciples. So he starts off the first few verses by sending them out. He's given them the power to heal just as he can. And he sends them out to do good works. And then they come back toward the end of the passage. In verses 10 through 17, he feeds 5,000 people. Again, people who have come to hear him speak. People who have come with their sick and they get to the end of the time, and they're all hungry, and Jesus feeds them miraculously. Let's pick it up in verse 18 then. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. And if that sounds familiar but not quite right, you're probably more used to the Matthew passage like I am. But that's the same story, just told from a different perspective. Peter says, God's Messiah. So let's move on then to verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. We've talked a little bit about this in the past, how Jesus knew the timeline. 
he knew how things were going to go. And so when a group of powerful disciples who'd been empowered to do miraculous works were ready to testify that he was God's Messiah, he knew he had to pull them back a little bit. So he says, don't tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. So here he is again. He's talking to his disciples. He's uh, gotten out of them this confession of his nature. And then he tells them that he's going to die. And then he goes right into giving them a command. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And then he expounds on that. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So he's speaking to his disciples. He's already given them miraculous powers, and then brought them back and performed another miracle on feeding the 5,000. Now, we don't know that those things happened close in time. We also don't know that the passage following is immediately following because it says one time he was praying. But in context, that's what's going on. And then he predicts his death and immediately speaks of discipleship. He's doing it again. It's as if he's telling them, here's, here's the future. I'm not going to be here. And once I'm not here, it's your job to keep telling people about me. And if you're going to be the ones who are telling people about me, here's what you have to do. Let's look more closely at this passage. So he just predicted his death when he says these things to me. If anyone wants to be my disciple, or that's sometimes translated, whoever wants to come after me. So he wants to follow me, he wants to be my disciple. They must deny themselves or disown themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Well, we understand take up their cross because we know the rest of the story. But the disciples didn't know the rest of the story. The rest of the story hadn't happened yet. We understand the idea of taking up their cross. Well, taking up the cross was very common for people who were being crucified. And so when Jesus uses this metaphor, they immediately, the disciples, the people in the room, their minds immediately went to, you know, last week's crucifixion when that guy had to carry his cross to the town square to be crucified. They, they, they see that. They visualize that. They understand what he's saying about doing this work, carrying this burden. They see that. And I think they probably remembered these words even more clearly when they then saw Jesus doing the exact same thing, dragging his cross even farther away. Let's talk about self-denial because that's a, a thing that we don't do. We don't do as Americans. We don't do... Uh, in modern America, we don't do that anymore. But he explains in those verses immediately following what that means. Let's check that. So he says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And so he's defined the extent of self-denial, even all the way up to losing your own life. That's how much self-denial should be available to you. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self. So gaining the whole world is set up as the antithesis of uh, denying yourself. And so it's the worldly things that we should be denying ourselves. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. So again, the idea of being ashamed of him is a thing that will keep you from self-denial. Does that make sense? If you are denying yourself, one of the things you will take out are worldly goods, and one of the things you will rely on are the words in the life of Christ. All right? So to sum all that up, self-denial is less worldly gain, more pride, because that's the opposite of shame, right? Pride. More pride in Jesus and the word of God, and to the extent of even if it costs us everything else. That's self-denial. We think of self-denial in small terms, right? Well, I'm not going to get my pumpkin spice latte today. I'm going to instead take that money and take it to work and give it to the uh, whatever they're raising money for at work. We think of that as self-denial. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about relying so much on him, on the word of God, relying so much on that, spending so much time on that, that everything else falls, fades away even to the extent of your own life. If your own life is demanded of you, 
you will rely on the word of God. You'll have pride in Christ and in his word. That is the true idea of self-denial that Jesus is talking about. So what can we gather out of that? What meditations can we take? Following Jesus means being less concerned with worldly gain. And that's maybe foundational. But still, if you focus on that, if you spend time in silence meditating on that, it will sink in. And again, you'll live your life differently. Replace your worldly habits with eternal habits. That's what it means to rely on Jesus in the word of God. Building habits that are uh, storing up treasures in heaven, if you will. How do you do that, though? What habits in your life are seeking worldly gain that you can eliminate and replace with something better. That's the best way to change your habits. We don't just get rid of the bad. If you have the habit of waking up every morning and, I don't know, smoking 10 cigarettes, and you want to stop doing that, I hope. But if that's your habit, you don't just say, well, I'm going to stop smoking cigarettes. Because then you're in this habit of getting up in the morning and going out on the balcony and lighting up cigarettes. And if you just try to stop that, you're going to wake up, you're going to go out on the balcony, and you're going to wonder where your cigarettes are. So you replace that with a better habit, right? You wake up and you go to the kitchen table and you open up your Bible. You read the Bible, right? So you replace bad things with good things. Or a third meditation might be that we need to refresh our habits daily because we are worldly people. We are living here and we are surrounded by the world. And the world is not the kind of place that rewards self-denial, right? The self-denial Instagram page doesn't have a million followers. I don't know if there is on no, Instagram page. But every day, you need to remind yourself about this life you're living. You need to remind yourself of your priority. You need to remind yourself of how you're living for the next life and not for this one. So again, from Luke 9, 23, Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Again, from John 13, a new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Second passage from Matthew 5, 13 through 16, but verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, from the King James Version. And finally, from Luke 9, 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, and follow me. How do we put all of those together? We need to love others sacrificially as a means of pointing the world toward God. That sacrificial love is the love that Jesus demonstrated. It's a form of self-denial. It's a form of relying on God. That type of love will have our light shine and point others toward God. That's the life of a Christian. That's why we perform right behavior. It's not as a means of trying to earn salvation. Look to the Old Testament and see how much people stumbled and fell when they tried that. It's not good behavior because we feel like we're forced to. We do good things because we want people to know Jesus. We want people to know about God. And this is how we do it. This is how Christ's disciples are called to live. If you're calling yourself a follower of Jesus, that's something you should be doing. And so we come to the conclusion of our study on meditation. You want to go back to that survey one more time and see if any more answers came in? I appreciate it. I hope that you will employ these ideas, that you will start meditating more. There we go. So I think we've come down a bit more. Smaller number here. I like that. That was 33% before. And we're still missing. Great. So focus. Really spend time every day. I suggest first thing in the morning. Get up before everybody else so you can have quiet time and meditate on Jesus, meditate on God, meditate on all these passages we've looked at. Find some passages of your own, find some of your favorites, spend time thinking about them, and you will immediately notice how your life will change. You will act differently, you will behave differently, you'll think about different things. If there's something you need from us today, we want to help. If today is the day that you want to be baptized, accepting Jesus' sacrifice, we're happy to do that. If you need prayers in your life or something that's holding you back from having the right relationship with him, we want to give you our prayers. Whatever you need from us, we are here to help, but we can't help until you tell us. So come forward and tell us as we stand and sing this song.